<laughs> okay, so we will start. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I will uh, just introduce the group and then the group will uh, present to you their findings. So hello, my name is Anna Maria Beckler and I am an education coordinator at Canadian Light Source. Um, before we start the Students on a Beamline seminar, there are some housekeeping items I would like to go over. So the first thing is that we are live streaming on YouTube. You would have seen, if you're on Zoom, would have seen the pop-up. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, so you can keep your <laughs> videos off, um, be muted and all that. Um, and if you are on Zoom, you can change the view. Uh, top right corner, there's a view button and you can change how um, the screen shows up for you where you can pick pin the speaker um, or have it a gallery view. So just so you're aware um, and keep the questions at the end. There will be a question and answer period at the end of their present seminar um, and you can ask in chat. Um, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. <clears throat> uh, so today our students on Beamline seminar is brought to you by students um, from the Weber Academy in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, this past school year, they have designed an experiment that looked at how open coal mining, waste in particular selenium, uh, impacted the nearby environment. Uh, so with their mentor, Dr. Derek Peak, a professor at the University of Saskatchewan College of Agriculture and Bioresources, um, they looked at their samples using the ideas beamline at the Canadian Light Source, and they're here to talk to you about their data and what they found. So I will hand it over to them um, and they can present to you their findings. Uh, and you're muted, sorry. <laughs> if... Okay, hello everyone. So to get started, we're going to introduce the entirety of our Beamline team. Um, we are a diverse group of students from Weber Academy in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and we're actually going to have everyone introduce themselves individually. So my name is David. I'm currently a grade 12 student. Um, and we have... My name is Eric. I'm also currently a grade 12 student. My name is Awad and I'm also a grade 12 student. My name is Griffin. I'm also a grade 12 student. My name is Shirley and I'm in grade 11. My name is Julie and I'm also in grade 11. Um, my name is Neha. I'm also in grade 11. My name is Alp and I'm also in grade 11. Hello, I'm Andres. I'm also in grade 11. My name is Chloe and I'm in grade 11. My name is Shiva, and I'm also in grade 11. Hi, I'm Leandra, I'm in grade 11. All right, so in this project, we wanted to investigate whether open pit coal mining led to the buildup of selenium uh, in the aquatic environment beyond background levels. And to basically investigate this, we collected soil, plant, and water samples uh, from three different river locations along the BC Alberta border. Um, and for the past few days, we attended a virtual beamline session with CLS uh, where, we, where we were able to investigate and analyze these samples uh, using XRF and Zane spectroscopy on ideas. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it off to Andres for land acknowledgments. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge Weber Academy in Calgary, Alberta is located on the traditional territories of Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pekani, the Tutsina, the Ayaks Nakoda, and the Métis Nations Region 3, and all the people who make the homes of Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta their home. We also acknowledge that our samples were collected from areas on the traditional and unceded territories of the Tunaha people in southeastern British Columbia. 
The CLS in, South, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan is located on the traditional territories of the Nihawa Cree, Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis. As students, we respect Indigenous ways of knowing oral traditions. We dedicated ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation, partnership, and collaboration. Our group was interested in this project because it is relevant to our local environment and industry. In May 2020, the Alberta government revoked a 1976 coal policy, uh, which protected the Rocky Mountains from open pit coal mining, which is essentially coal mining, which exposes coal to the open air. Although public pressure uh, later compelled the government to reinstate this protective policy, six companies still hold um, exploration permits um, in the area, uh, some of which have been fined for significant water pollution. As Alberta grapples with the looming transition away from fossil fuels and a coal-based economy and with increased environmental awareness, as contemporary environmental studies correlate open pit coal mining with selenium pollution, um, it is crucial that we better understand how uh, local coal mining operations are affecting us and our environment and whether remediation projects which seek to reduce selenium concentration to safe levels are effective. Um, pollution does not respect the boundaries that we put in place, but it spills across borders and creeps up trophic levels. <laughs> As such, the issues of selenium pollution, selenium pollution from open pit coal mining are not unique to Alberta or British Columbia. We are focusing our research on southern Alberta and southeastern British Columbia, however, as indicated by the map, either to the abundance of open pit coal mines in the area and the abundance of reports of pollution in the area. Selenium is a naturally occurring element that is beneficial at the right quantities, but it has a very narrow range between when it is deficient and when it's in excess, which means it is toxic. Um, in drinking water, selenium is considered to be toxic when it exceeds 0.05 parts per million. Um, and as you can see in the picture, um, open pit coal mining contributes um, to selenium in the environment because runoff from waste rock produced through the process of open pit coal mining um, introduces selenium into the aquatic environment. Um, this affects humans when humans ingest food or water with higher levels of selenium. Um, and this selenium poisoning specifically in food occurs as a result of biomagnification. <clears throat> and so selenium passes through the food chain and as it does it biomagnifies. Um, so it passes from algae to um, insects and then to aquatic organisms like um, fish, um, birds and amphibians, and then it reaches humans at a very high concentration. So therefore the exposure of smaller organisms in the aquatic environment to higher levels of selenium um, impacts humans in a very negative way. So excess selenium in bodies um, have many negative impacts because it primarily affects um, organic um, organisms living in the environment and it also pollutes drinking water. Um, so fish that have too many too much selenium in their bodies actually have um, are at risk of not producing as much offspring and having reproductive issues, and they also have um, birth defects. So as you can see in the picture at the top, um, there's a fish missing a gill plate because of selenium poisoning, and also the picture at the bottom it shows spinal deformities caused by selenium poisoning in fish. Um, high concentrations of selenium, poison, of selenium in fish can also cause things like liver damage, paralysis, and death. And according to a 2017 study done by the Canadian government, in humans, chronic exposure to selenium can cause nausea, fatigue, skin lesions, and neurological disorders. So this brings us to our research question. Has the presence of open pit coal mining and the release of selenium um, near rivers led to an accumulation of selenium in the form of different species in the aquatic environment um, as measured in water plants and soil beyond background levels. So with the research question in hand, we went about actually designing our experiment with which involved looking at different classes of variables. In terms of independent variables, we looked at different locations for our samples. So we had three locations at an active mine, one control, which was upstream of an inactive mine. And our third uh, location was an inactive mine. Additionally, we changed the actual type of sample that we took. So our team looked at plant, soil, and water samples to get a comprehensive 
uh, view on the effects on the environment. And we also varied uh, within each sample. So for example, we took soil at different distances from the water and we looked at different species of plants, specifically paraphyton, algae, and moss. In terms of dependent variables, in term, uh, what we were actually measuring, we found relative selenium concentrations using uh, the beamline along with speciation of, of selenium. So either selenate or selenite, selenate or selenite ions. And on top of that, we also measured the acidity of our water samples using the pH scale and litmus paper. Finally, for controls, we controlled for the time of year by taking all samples of the same day during spring. And throughout the collection and, uh, and preparation process, we made sure to standardize uh, our entire procedure. In addition to that, we also standardized the class of coal mines. So both the active and inactive coal mine were both metallurgical coal mines. In the control location, we did not expect to see any toxic amount of selenium. However, in the sources downstream from the active and inactive mines, we expected to see higher concentrations of selenium compared to that of the control location due to the presence of the coal mines. The speciation of selenite or selenate found would lead to toxic levels in the ecosystem with selenite being toxic in the water and selenate being toxic in the terrestrial environment. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about the sampling process now. So. As Awad said, we had different mines. The first mine was the active mine, which we collected the soil, uh, samples from downstream from that mine in order to see the selenium concentration over there. We couldn't get a control for this mine because there was no access to it. However, for the second mine, we had a control location, which is upstream, which will be seen on a map. And we also, didn't, uh, like this is for the inactive mine. And we also had the uh, sample taken downstream. So this map is for the first mine. Uh, you can see like the blue circle over there. That's the where the mine was at. And the yellow circle, that's where we sampled from. You can see how the water went all the way down there. And this is the second mine. Um, I don't know if you can see the yellow circles up there. And we uh, that's where we took the sample from. The water went all the way down here. And that's where the mine, the inactive mine was at. And then um, the yellow circle down here is where we took the downstream from the inactive mine. And those were all the samples we took. Now, in comparison, this is what it looked like. This was the, where the active mine was at. This is where, or, yeah, the active mine was up here. This is where we took the sample from for the active mine. This is where the control location was. This was the inactive mine. This is where we took the downstream source. And this is where we took the control. First, we had the location of the one, And then we had one on the two samples using a soil probe. And then we would extract the soil and remove the bacteria as possible. So as I mentioned before, we sampled three different species of plants. We sampled paraphyton at all three locations. Paraphyton is essentially a complex mixture of algae, cyanobacteria, which is simply bacteria that self-photosynthesize, and detritus which is commonly found on rocks, we were able to find it at all three locations. Additionally, we, took, we looked at algae, which is a simple non-flowering, often aquatic plant lacking roots, stem, and vascular tissue. And we found this at the active and control site. In addition to that, we found moss at the inactive and control site as well. Moss is another simple green plant lacking true roots. Because we couldn't find algae at the inactive site and moss at the active site, we did not collect samples there. Um, so as Awad said, we sampled three kinds of different plants, which is uh, periphyton, algae, and moss. Uh, we identified the periphyton on rocks in the streams. We collected the rocks and we afterwards uh, removed the periphyton uh, from the rocks using a scalpel to scrape it off. And we also, uh, for the algae, we scooped it up into a vial with um, plastic forks and toothbrushes, and we removed the moss from the surfaces, also using um, forks. Before we could actually collect any water samples, we had to do a few things first. We had to label the vials according to the location. So whether it was the active mine, uh, the control or the inactive mine, and the speed of the water. So whether it was running or still water. Then we attached these sample vials to hockey sticks as seen in these two photos 
so that we can re safely reach out into the river and collect our water. Um, we then performed a triple rinse to get rid of any residue and dust within the containers. So this um, involves us picking up water in the, in the containers until it was about half full, uh, swirling it around and then dumping it out and repeating that process three times. And then we actually collected the samples and stored them in a cool and dark place so that no um, microorganisms could grow. I'm sorry, but we can't hear you. ideas beam line to collect data to see if we could find selenium. There, at the ideas beam line, we use the techniques of XRS and SAMES. So as mentioned before, we use the techniques XRF and Zanes, but I'm going to give a rundown of what exactly those are. So XRF is an X-ray method where it uses, uh, where it ionizes electrons in an atom, and when the outer electrons move into the inner area, and it releases energy in the form of photons. And these photons are graphed against the amount of energy used and produces a graph that we can use to analyze and come to conclusions about based on the elements and their presence inside of it. Uh, here's a diagram down here of what exactly goes on. And XRF also stands for X-ray fluorescence compared to Zanes, which stands for X-ray absorption near edge structure. Zanes is used to find the shape and speciation of the substance they put into the machine. And eventually we produce our own graph based on the data that it gives us. And we end up finding the speciation of say the selenium we use for our experiment. Um, XRF uses only the elements that are found in the blue area on the periodic table on the slides. And Zanes might be too weak to use elements like for example, calcium. So it doesn't use the same elements that XRF uses. And here are graphs that um, show what XRF and Zanes look like. So XRF, it has like the relative abundance of each of the elements in the samples and it has the photon count versus the energy used. Zanes, this is a, like a graph that shows what speciation of selenium it is based on where the peak is at and essentially what shape it is. And as we can see, selenate and selenite are on this graph, which are speciations that we mentioned later on in this presentation. Um, we will now talk about the data that we collected for each of our samples using these two methods. Um, this graph shows the XRF graph of all of our plant and soil samples. Our plant samples included um, algae, moss, and periphyton, and our soil samples included um, soil samples that we collected in the water, which we call sediment, and the soil samples which we collected on the shore. Oh, um, we noticed um, elements such as calcium, iron, and we mostly focused on selenium, which we can see between the 10,000 and 12,000 energy. And we will now talk about the data that we collected for our soil samples. Um, so this graph shows the relative concentration of selenium in all our soil samples. With this graph, we observed that um, the active mine site had the had the lowest con relative concentration of selenium, which we can see here, and the control location had the rel had relatively the greatest concentration of selenium, which we can see mostly significant here. Um, each of these three graphs show um, the relative concentration of selenium in each of our lo locations separately. Um, in the active mine location, we noticed that the relative concentration of selenium was greater in our sediment samples compared to our shore samples, um, and it had the greatest, the least photon count. And um, in our control location, we noticed that the relative concentration of selenium was significantly greater in our sediment samples compared to our shore samples, and it had the highest photon count. And in our inactive mine location, we noticed that the relative concentration of selenium in our shore samples and in our sediment samples was similar. This is our 
same graph for uh, the speciation of selenium in the soil. So the black dotted line over here represent the uh, represent the peak of selenite. And we got the data from uh, uh, external resource. And the green dotted line over here represents the peak for selenite. And the orange line, the orange graph over here represents the control location. The blue line represents the active mine, and the gray line represents the inactive mine. Uh, from the graph, we can see that all three uh, all three locations line up with the selenite uh, location, sel selenite peak. This means selenite is uh, presented in all three locations, and we can also see that in active mine, selenite is also represented in this uh, in the active mine. Um, from the graph, we can also see that there's a very small little peaks along the main peak. This shows that there's only a small amount of selenium is represented in different locations. Um, this is because the insufficient amount of selenium uh, will cause inaccurate reading, and that's why there are small peaks along the main peak. This is a summarize about the speciation of selenium in different locations. We can see that mostly selenite is presented in all three locations and only for active mine, they are selenate presented as well. Um, for, su for summary, we um, assume that the relative concentration of selenium at the controlled location was the background relative concentration of selenium. So comparing with the control location, the active mine site has, has lower relative concentration of selenium, and it was at the downstream of the active coal mine. Um, our explanation for that outcome is that the water might, might have been remediated by the coal mine company because that company was fined years ago due to um, pollutant reasons. And from our Zane's graph, we found that the soil samples collected in the river at the active mine site contain selenate, which is a possible pollutant from the coal mine. And the samples from all three locations, they all contain selenite, which is generally more toxic in aquatic systems. And selenate is more toxic um, to soil organisms. Hi, so next I'll be talking about the plant data that we got for the XRF. So the three graphs provided here show the different samples of data from the active mine, the control location, and the inactive mine. As we stated previously by my colleague Awad, uh, we were only able to get periphyton, we, we were able to get periphyton from all three locations, but we could only grab moss from the control and the inactive, and we can only grab algae from the active and control location. As such, we can make a much larger uh, inference from our data, though relative, not conclusive. Um, on periphyton than we can about the other two species, which will make which we can make smaller conclusions from or other smaller inferences from our data. Uh, as which as you can see here, the periphyton at the active location showed a much lower concentration of selenium compared to the control, which was our highest, and the inactive, which was our median location. Uh, contrary to that, the algae in our active locations uh, had the greatest concentration and had the least at the control, and the moss had the greatest in the inactive and the least in the control. This also allows us to infer a lot of data about the interactions between selenium and the species of plants in the aquatic systems. So from, these, from this data, we could also infer that selenium had a lot of interaction with the water uh, selenium concentration, which was how it managed to obtain it largely in the first place where we saw that it had the highest concentration of the control and least in the active mine, whereas the um, moss sample showed us uh, a quite the contrary data. As such, in the photos beneath, we saw exactly what we found at the location as well as how we were sampling it in the process. Okay, so on to some analysis of the Zane data that we got from our plant samples. So these are specifically, uh, so this graph shows the Zane's uh, graph 
for specifically the periphyton samples at all three locations. So basically what we're trying to do here is identify uh, the relative concentrations of selenite and selenate by comparing uh, each graph to standards uh, that we know contain selenite or selenate. So the dotted line on the left here is selenite, is sort of like the peak or the edge, um, what we'd expect for selenite. The dotted line on the right um, is what we would expect for selenate. And we can see here that uh, at the control and inactive locations, um, we mainly found selenite, uh, judging by the location of the peak um, of those two graphs. But at the active mine location, which is in orange here, uh, we found that it mainly contained selenite, but the peak is also slightly to the right. So we, uh, we believe that it might also contain a bit of selenate, but, but we really can't be too sure here because um, of how noisy the graph is uh, due to the low concentrations of, sel of selenium we found overall. So because of how noisy it is, we can't really be sure, uh, and this is less accurate than uh, we might have liked. Um, and we also did the same sort of analysis for the algae samples. Uh, here we can see that at the control lo uh, location, um, we mainly found selenite. And then at the active location here in orange, uh, it was mainly selenate, or uh, we infer that it's mainly selenate. So to basically summarize here, um, for our data on periphyton and uh, algae for zanes, uh, considering that selenite is more reactive and harmful than selenate, um, we can sort of, uh, um, we can see that uh, there is less uh, selenite at the active mine location um, and a bit more selenate, which might suggest, uh, which might be evidence to support um, what we knew already, which is that Tech, the mining company at the active mine, uh, was pursuing remediation efforts to decrease the amount of selenium, as well as to decrease the amount of sort of the harmful selenite there at the active mine. Um, so yeah, and we also collected data on uh, our moss samples, though uh, those were inconclusive. Uh, while analyzing the XRF graphs for the water samples, um, we noticed that there were no selenium detected in the, in the water samples. This does not mean that there was no selenium, it just means that the selenium present was below the detection limit. However, we did find something interesting. There were significantly high relative concentrations of calcium in the soil and plant samples. As a by a Peck report in 2018, it says that calcium and carbonates are released into the environment, producing uh, calcites. This, we can infer, infer from this that the calcium peaks seen in the XRF graph represent calcite. However, we cannot be sure of this um, because we were not able to perform Zane's graphs, Zane testing on the calcium. Calcium, uh, calcite is needed in the environment. It regulates pH and it maintains healthy water quality. However, too much calcite will produce, will precipitate and cause rocks and gravel to bind as seen in this picture here. Um, the government of Canada says that this will um, prevent fish from laying their eggs and, and um, destroy their habitats. All this calcite led us to our second research question, which was, has open pit coal mining led to an accumulation of calcite in nearby aquatic ecosystems? These three graphs are relative concentration of calcium found in the soil and in the plant samples. This peak here shows the active mine relative concentration level and how it was considerably higher than the control and the inactive mine concentration levels. The size of the peaks um, show this, um, the amount of relative concentration. And uh, I'd just like to give a shout out to our great mentor, Derek Peak. All right, uh, we decided to measure the pH of our water samples um, because we found an interesting connection between the high relative levels of calcium concentration that we inferred to be calcite. Um, so pH is a scaling system that indicates the concentration um, of ions that would make a substance either acidic or basic, um, where zero to seven would be acidic, seven would be neutral, and seven to 14 would be basic. 
So we use this pH paper here to measure the pH of our water samples. And this image on the far side here is uh, the system we had set up for ourselves. So uh, each of the different locations are color coded. So the active mine, the control, and the inactive mine. And at each of these locations, we uh, took samples from an area of still water and an area of running water, and we did duplicates of each. We then took this data and we put it into this table here, um, showing the average pH of the um, water samples at each location. So as seen here, um, in the active mine location, the average pH was about 7.5, which was slightly basic. Um, in the control location, the average pH was about 6.9, which was fairly neutral. Um, and in the inactive mine location, the average pH was about 6.3, which was slightly acidic. Um, it's also to be noted that the optimum pH in river water is about 7.4, which is regulated by the presence of bicarbonate buffer ions. This figure here um, is just a diagram of the equations that show how this calcite will in interact with the aquatic environment. Um, so the calcite itself is an insoluble compound, so it will only dissolve uh, it will dissolve very, very little uh, when in water. However, it will react with, uh, with carbon dioxide that's dissolved in water to form this compound here called calcium bicarbonate. This compound is a soluble compound. So when in water, it will dissociate into its ions. So calcium ions will be formed alongside of bicarbonate buffer ions. Um, these, bi these bicarbonate buffer ions will regulate the pH to be about 7.4. We took this information and we, uh, we applied it to um, our pH, pH measure, measurements to try and give an explanation as to why they were what we observed. So in our first active mine location, um, we observed the average pH to be about 7.5, so slightly basic. In this location, there was also the highest relative calcium concentration that we inferred to be calcite. Um, so with this, we suspect that with a higher calcite concentration, this would ultimately increase the um, concentration of bicarbonate ions that would be produced. So um, the pH that would regulate the pH to be about 7.4, which is fairly consistent with our measurement of 7.5. Um, a possible explanation that uh, we came up with um, for the calcite concentration being so high was that maybe the calcite remediation done by the mining companies was not as effective as their um, selenium remediation. Another interesting thing to note is that there was recent uh, reme remediation activity done in about February of 2020 um, in which the tech mining company began filtering and treating this water and then taking that extra excess um, contaminated water and releasing it directly into the nearby um, Fonding River. In our second location, which was our control location, um, we found the pH to be relatively neutral at about 6.9. Um, and the explanation that we came up with this um, was that this was a colder location, as seen with this image here. There was a lot of snow and ice surrounding the area where we sampled. Um, and it's known that uh, gas and liquid solubility will um, increase in, at colder temperatures. So therefore, we suspected that there, must, that there might be uh, more um, water that is saturated with CO2. Um, so therefore, that would have increased um, these reactants, which would, again, ultimately increase the concentration of the bicarbonate ions that were formed. Um, we also suspected that this would have had less of an impact on bicarbonate ion concentration than a di direct increase in calcite on, uh, concentration itself, as seen in the previous location. And for our final location, um, which was our inactive mine site, um, we observed the pH to be slightly acidic, um, and we suspected um, various reasons for this. Um, there may have been acidic mine drainage, which is fairly common in um, inactive mines that haven't been or in, that haven't been remediated properly. Um, and this was observed from the orange tint, so this could indicate the presence of iron or other heavy metals in the water. Um, however, further research would need to be conducted in order to come up with a more conclusive statement. This location also had the lowest relative calcium concentration. Um, so there are various reasons that we um, came up with for this. Um, we suspect that it might be because this mine has been inactive since the 80s. So it's been a while since the calcite would have been released into this water, uh, water source. Um, another reason is possibly calcium deposition. So um, remembering and earlier in the presentation, we uh, mentioned how this location is downstream from our control site. Um, which we were talking about in the last slide. Um, and this calcite will travel um, as a sediment um, through the river. 
So it's possible that this um, calcite may have uh, gotten deposited um, on the sides of the riverbed, resulting in a lower concentration downstream. Um, we were unable to perform Zane's analysis on our calcium. Um, so we assumed that this high relative concentration of calcium um, was in the form of calcite due to um, our pH analysis and uh, many government reports that have been put out um, addressing the prominence of uh, calcium in rivers in the form of calcite. The next thing to note is that while we were sampling downstream of the coal mine, we noticed that there were quite a few larvae at the shore's tip. Um, so by the images, we, we think that the larva is likely a stonefly naiad larva, which is interesting because the stonefly naiad larva is actually an indicator species. An indicator species um, is sensitive to environmental changes. And so the presence or the abundance of an indicator species can indicate um, the health of an ecosystem. The stonefly naiad larva um, presence and its abundance at the active site location would suggest that there is high water quality. So the water is cool, um, flowing, clean, has high oxygen concentration, and is also at a neutral pH. Um, so we have three general conclusions from our um, experiment. The first one is that we found the selenium concentrations are generally uh, insignificant at all sites in the context of ecology, meaning uh, there is nothing to pose a significant risk to humans or wildlife. Our second um, conclusion is that as selenium and selenide concentrations at site uh, three, so the inactive site is um, higher than that at site one, which is the active site, which is directly uh, downstream from the current tech mine. Uh, this is an indication that the tech um, mine has been, uh, the tech mine's selenium remediation has been generally effective after uh, the, they have been fined for uh, their pollution. And our third conclusion is that um, the calcium concentrations is the highest at the active site compared to the inactive site. And this is evidence to support that the calcite remediation is not as successful as that of um, selenium. Uh, we definitely had some sources of error in their sampling. Um, for example, although we collected enough samples, samples in terms of portion, uh, we could have collected more just in case we needed more duplicates. Also, there were lots of rocks sediments in our samples collected. And from our research, we found out that many rocks contain selenium. So therefore, the relative concentration of selenium in many of our samples could have been affected by the rocks in them. Um, also, we collected our samples in spring, but, uh, but, in, but in spring, um, selenium is very affected because of the snow glacier runoffs. So we could have definitely gathered our samples in other seasons where selenium is not very affected. So on the other hand, there was little to no selenium found in water samples due to the nature of water. Um, when water goes through S XRF and Zanes as a sample, it reflects part of the light rays, which makes detecting elements very difficult. So we could have collected the precipitates in the water samples and used XRF and things to analyze them. The last thing we would like to acknowledge all the people that helped make this experiment possible. Ms. Garris and Ms. Nogo for being our VMON advisors. Mr. Rollins for helping us get transportation to get our samples. Dr. Weber for providing us the opportunity to join this hub. Amanda Pfeiffer and Anna Maria Beckler who, and all the staff at CLS who helped this experiment. We'd also like to thank Dr. David Peake for providing insight into soil sampling, Dr. David Muir for helping us with XRF and veins graphing, Bonnie, and we'd also like to thank Bonnie DeBase for giving us insight into our grant, as well as Jackie Woodman for helping us with the grassy mountain mine. We'd also like to acknowledge NSERC, 
who prove a promo science grant help fund CLS education. And lastly, we'd like to thank the audience for listening to our presentations. And lastly, any questions? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, there's one here. Hi. So at the beginning of your talk, you talked about how selenium potentially accumulates as it passes through the food chain and potentially ends up inside people. And when you were looking at your Zanes data, you were kind of struggling because the concentration is not high enough. So do you, did you talk about possibly looking at fish from the river or even some of these so, indicator yeah. speeches that you talked that about? Is a, that is a very good question. Initially for our project, we actually were interested uh, in pursuing fish uh, just because that's a more, that's kind of like you mentioned, that's a really more direct way of how selenium could impact uh, human communities and environments. Unfortunately, uh, kind of the testing the ethics uh, of, like, of like living organisms on the beam line was difficult. So we unfortunately had to abandon that uh, idea. And we focused instead uh, kind of on plants, like parafine and algae and moss instead. Thank you. Uh, there's another one here uh, on the Zoom call, uh, Tracy. Hello, thank you. First of all, good presentation, everybody. I, uh, I really like the way that um, you looked at, at, at the problem from several different angles and pulled those pieces together to, um, to try and inform your question. I thought that was really, really good. Thank you. Um, my question is about concentration. And you were very careful with your language throughout in order to use relative, relative concentrations and relative amounts and things like that. If you could please clarify for me what you mean when you use that phrase. Uh, sure, I, I think Griffin wants to answer that question. Okay. Hi, so yes, the data that we got from the XRF data was all relative concentrations of photon counts. So it's given to us as a relative approximation in reference to the other elements that show up on the curves. As you saw in the, in the grand uh, data scheme that we got, there are many different peaks that show different elements. As all of those, as one element will change, the others will respond accordingly. So when you get one data piece, it's not necessarily entirely representative of a like absolute amount rather than its relative quantity compared to other uh, elements within there. Okay, so if I could ask you to build on that then, um, when you compare one sample to another, what kinds of factors go into whether or not that might show a different concentration? So mainly what we had looked at was are there different speciations of selenium within these samples? Because if the speciation is changing, we can make the we can begin to assume that that change indicates that something is either being added or removed, or it's reacting in a way that's causing that change. As such, it's it must have a direct effect on that selenium proportion. Okay. Okay. I think. Dr. Blythe would like to build on this as well by the looks of it. No, no, I, I have a couple of unrelated questions. I can uh, just quickly to like elaborate on your question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but to kind of answer your question in terms of comparisons, uh, because we, we're only getting relative amounts, compar our comparisons we made on XRF graphs are only valid between like the same type of sample. So because we were only getting relative amounts, we really only compared soil to other soil and plants to other plants under the assumption that as long as all like our soil are generally homogeneous samples that are similar enough, their, their peaks of like relative concentration are comparable. So that's why, for example, we wouldn't be able to compare uh, plant peaks and soil peaks because the peaks don't represent absolute values. They represent relative concentrations. 
and di that like could be different depending on that specific material. Does that help answer your question? It, it does, thank you. It, it helps me understand where you're coming from when you when yeah. you make those statements and that's good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll do my questions now. So um, when you were talking about the results of your pH analysis and speculating why the pH might be different in certain locations, you showed a picture of one location, you talked about the orange tint, and you speculated that might be due to iron. But you have XRF data from these locations. Did you see iron in the XRF data? Uh, short answer, yes, we did. Um, Chloe is going to expand on that as a member of the PhD. <laughs> So after XRF analysis of our water samples, um, we found that um, detection using the um, IDEAS beamline with XRF on water samples wasn't very effective um, for various reasons. Um, so we had to rely on our XRF data for our soil and plant samples. Um, so we did find significant quantities of um, iron, comparatively speaking, uh, to the other elements that were present. Um, and we just... Um, on the basis of that, we just sort of concluded um, iron is a very common element um, in soil um, and plants. So that was sort of um, our thought process. That was our reasoning for that. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, second question about your, is also about your pH measurements. So um, you showed a picture of a pH paper scale with integers on it, but your results were like 6.9 and 7.3. So how confident are you in your, your number of significant figures there? And did you actually use pH paper or a pH meter? So we used the pH paper. Um, however, those numbers there with the decimal points, those were the average. So we um, did a lot of um, testing of many different samples. So as I mentioned earlier, we had um, from each location, there was a, a, an area where we collected uh, the still water and an area where we collected the running water. Um, and then we also had duplicates for those. So there were four different pH uh, measurements for each location that we did. Um, so that sort of increases the um, reliability of our pH measurements. Um, and it allowed us to calculate that um, that average pH value for each location that had the uh, decimal points with the significant figures. Yeah, my, my question is a bit simpler because I, you know, I, I've used pH paper I think once ever, and I've been around a long time. Um, so, if you take a pH measurement using pH paper, can you get a decimal point? How do you get a decimal point? It would be more on the basis of just your visual observation of it. Um, so, I guess you could get a decimal point if you really feel that the color that you're seeing is in between the two colors that is uh, that are indicated on the um, container. Um, so I guess, yes, um, but it's a little bit difficult to quantify that. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yep. Um, so, it's kind of a truism in environmental chemistry that you only find what you are looking for. For example, you know, with the recent um, uh, investigations into COVID with wastewater or looking for horm hormones in drinking water, they'll, they'll, they only find them if they're actually looking for specific hormones. Um, selenium occurs in many different forms, and I'm not sure exactly what you, I saw that you were testing for selenate and selenite, but, um, you know, originally, so, so why there's a selenium problem in the Elk Valley is because of selenium, trace amounts of selenium that are present in things like pyrite and sphalerite um, in the ore, and when they remove them, this kind of uh, leaches out over time. So, but selenium also occurs as organic forms. It occurs as a selenide. Um, it can be absorbed. It, it occurs as elemental species. And you didn't necessarily look for these. So I'm wondering um, how robust do you think your identification of selenite is um, in that context? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> no, uh, that's fine. So concerning the robustness, I guess, yeah, David, I don't know if he wants to answer it. 
Yeah, so one of the main things to consider is that we did not find like a, like a very significant quantity of selenium. Um, so our Zanes analysis might not be like terribly like, like just like might not be very accurate um, because of how noisy the graphs were. So we certainly can't be sure that it was selenite. Um, however, we, we did compare like the, uh, like the edge or like the peaks on the Zanes graphs to some of uh, our other resources, like what we found for elemental selenium, as well as selenomethionine and selenocysteine, which are two common organic forms. Um, and we thought like, considering all of that, uh, selenite was still like sort of the best match. But again, because of how noisy the graphs were, uh, we still really can't be sure and more analysis would certainly have to be done. Excellent response, thanks. Is there any other questions? Is there any questions in the room? In, in the room? Oh yeah, any questions at our room? No, no. There oh, no. there's, yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, if you can't know the concentration truly, how could you make, from your data, can you make an assessment of, uh, in terms of biomagnification of concentration, like how much is present and then how much would have to, um, a human would have to be exposed to your particular sample. Can yeah. you make that or is that uh, not possible? Did, did everyone hear? Did you guys hear the question she asked? Should I repeat it? You should repeat it. Yeah, okay. So uh, one of our uh, biology teachers, Ms. Shazadi, essentially asked, given that we kind of only know like, relative amounts and relative concentrations, are we able to make any assessment, uh, any judgment on, for example, how much of this sample like would be needed uh, to create like significant amounts of selenium within a human. So kind of, uh, and to answer that question, no, we cannot, just because we're getting relative amounts. And this kind of comes back to experimental design and why it's so, uh, why it's important for us to like have had a control because we're only getting relative amounts. We can't actually make uh, those judgments on absolute amounts. And so I guess the best indicator we have of whether selenium amounts uh, are like, let's say abnormal in terms of, uh, or above background levels in terms of answering a research question, we kind of compare those uh, to the control. So like, I guess short answer, no, we can't really make concrete like quantitative judgments. Any other questions in the room? Uh, no, it looks like there's none. Uh, in our room. Okay, and I'm assuming we are done on the Zoom except for one last question. Yeah, I, uh, I typically reserve the right to ask the last question because I, I want to wait until um, people are able to exhaust their questions related to the, the research that you did and the science that you learned and have reported. And you did a very good job. It was a very good presentation. Um, the setup you had was excellent to help us understand why this was important work and, and how you collected your samples and everything. You did a very, very good job. I appreciate that. Thank you. My question is to each of you, by the way, not just you, but for each student, please to respond. You've now had the opportunity to use the only synchrotron in Canada in your research at the high school level. I'm going to assume that you learned lots. You certainly showed us that you learned lots about all kinds of science. Going beyond that, what did you learn that you will take with you as you move from grade 12 out into the world, maybe into post-secondary, maybe into the job force, um, things like that, or from grade 11 into grade 12? Um, what's going to stick with you? What did you learn from this experience? Uh, so I guess since I'm already up here, uh, <laughs> I, I can start kind of before. Uh, I actually, I've done Beamline before, like two years ago, actually. And I kind of vaguely remember the same question uh, as well. But in this case, uh, one thing like personally that I'm going to take forward, is kind of the ability to uh, adapt on the fly, given that uh, kind of for the duration of our project, 
we were we weren't necessarily expecting to find such low selenium levels in water it's just that we couldn't even test zanes on them and so kind of that uh very quick rapid switch into looking like hey like what else was there interesting we could dive into uh and eventually switching to calcium looking at uh, like uh, calcium and calcite and kind of expanding our research where we wouldn't necessarily have expected or to have gone before i think that short-term flexibility is something that's useful ac across all like, facets of life. Hi, I guess I'll be going next then. Uh, for me personally, I realized as we went through this and especially as we were sampling how useful going on tangents off of like knowledge paths can be so beneficial to how quickly you can adapt and how strongly you can make your foundation for an argument and a point in this perspective as well as how quickly you can understand your data because as we were learning more and more prior to our sampling and we looked into alternatives and side paths in case our data wasn't how we expected it we had already started looking into things like we briefly touched upon calcium we looked into arsenic and other generally found heavy metals so the, once we found that our data wasn't as conclusive as we had hoped it would be and as we realized that we wouldn't be getting conclusive data we could use our foundations to make a much more vast point and look at the our, look at the problem from a lot more perspectives which can be applied in many different ways Um, as for me, this project involved so much teamwork, and I think my communication skill, as well as like teamwork skill, as well as um, like kind of PowerPoint skills, improved. <laughs> so I think that's a great journey for me to do Beamline. Um, yeah. So just to add on for me too, I believe like what really was eye opening about this project was how collaborative it, it is and instead of like normal like science homework where you, you just like you can just do it in the, your room by yourself like this involves a lot more teamwork and interacting with others I, I propose that normal science is more like this and less in your room <laughs> Um, so I guess one thing that I learned was uh, sort of the importance of preparedness, as well as like uh, sort of rapid like flexibility that Owan talked about earlier. So I can vividly recall while we were collecting our plant samples, um, we sort of weren't able to find like everything that we wanted to find at all three locations. So we had to sort of like rapidly adapt and sort of like switch to something else so that we were able to compare the various locations. Uh, by taking like other samples that we were able to find uh, at those sites. Um, so from this project, I personally have learned a lot about how uh, just really how common it is to have um, negative results in research and you're as um, everyone else was mentioning the um, importance of the adaptability to be able to just um, like shift focuses and shift directions um, and really look for and still analyze this data and look for the reasons behind like why this was the data that you were getting um, and that sort of thing and so i think that was really beneficial for me because really yay there isn't selenium there that that is causing a problem <laughs> um, I think I learned that um, it's okay to like not get the results that you expect because I feel like a lot of times when you get the results you expect, like you can feel really defeated. So I think we learned that it's okay to not get what you expect because you can like make do with like what you have and like take other paths. Um, so before we did any of the sampling or the testing on the x-ray we were doing the research and I 
kept reading about the negative impact of selenium on the ecosystem. And then I read about the remediation that Tech is doing on one of their mines that we test at. And this started last year. So I, I was really doubtful that there would be uh, decreased co concentrations of selenium. Um, but when we got our results back, I was quite relieved in a way. Um, and it like, I, now I know that the re remediation processes actually work and they're do, doing something to make the environment better. Uh, and I, I think that gives me and all of us in the room a better sense of hope for the world. Hope is an excellent thing to have. Thank you for that. Um, I guess something I learned was like, we did a lot of background research before we actually got into the experiment. And even though like our presentation mostly consisted of the actual experiment, like the importance of like gathering the knowledge that you like that's available to you and being like as informed as you can about something before you actually like step into it is like super important to like lay the foundation. Yep, the most important tool that you will use is the one located right here in your head your brain and the interpretation. That's the most important thing. Um, I think this, this entire project um, realized that um, learning and like the importance of sort of delegation and like allowing yourself to be assigned a role and then bringing it together with a bunch of other people is kind of like a really awesome feeling. And it's just like nice to know that you were like a part of a bigger collective. The one thing I learned is to be careful with the words, especially in this case, when we don't have much selenium present in the location. So we need to, we can be very conclusive about our data. And also for the next time, maybe try to limit our source of error and then try to make the research better in general. I don't know why I got started last. I think Andres should have gone last with like the whole thing. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll slap. Never mind. Um, so I guess my thing is uh, research is fun. And so if you want to like actually find those conclusive results and Really understand something it takes time and it takes um, just continuing to stick with something so perseverance excellent um, <laughs> hi uh, so I feel like it was said a lot but I really did learn that like the results that we get won't be exactly what we were expecting like to be honest I was really sad when I didn't find like spikes in selenium <laughs> I still care about people, but like I, I really wanted to like have our data good. And you know, um, it was it was interesting. I was a little disappointed when we didn't get the selenium spikes. Then you know, our group was like, oh, let's check calcium because you know we see this in plants and soil, and there might be calcite and whatnot. And I was like, okay, sure. So I guess that adapting to different solutions when you can't find one presented right away. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so that's everything that we learned. Thank you so much for asking that question. Ah, but we're not done yet, because now I'm going to pick on your teacher. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's finally their turn. Yes. Yeah, there, it's definitely an experience for the teachers going through something like this as well. And so I invite you to share what you've learned and what you might take forward, and maybe what you're hoping your students will take forward. Well, actually, I wanted to come up here even before you asked, because I just wanted to say how proud I am of these kids, or students, and <laughs> I'm tearing up, because this is my last class with you guys. And I just love it. You guys did such a good job. What I learned is I can, I can be, um, I can help, but I think the kids can do so much better when they're just left to, to their own devices. They can find so many cool results. Um, I was trying pushing and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop pushing. And then they, they just took off and did such an amazing job. So uh, I'm just so proud of them. Yeah.
Well, maybe you should have done. Um, yeah, I think it was so wonderful to see you guys all come together as a group. I know we struggled a little bit with morning meetings. Um, and so I had some concerns we weren't going to necessarily pull it together the way we would hope, but you really did all do your individual research the way we had hoped you, you did. Um, and what I learned, and I think I, it was more like a relearning experience, was that, um, you know, we are your support staff, basically, um, and that, you know, you're going to make your own decisions and, you know, we're just kind of trying to keep you off the rails and help you with that direction. Um, and if we can do that, then, I mean, you, you put together a wonderful presentation. We are so proud of you. Like, um, yeah, I take, I take away with, with me that it's important to let go <laughs> and let you guys um, make your own mistakes and fix your own mistakes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for the support from Beamline. It was awesome. It was a great experience. Well, thank you guys. With that, I'd Actually, like to- I wanted to add one thing. So I guess while they were singing our praises, it's only fair. Our Beamline team kind of recognizes all the amazing work uh, that our teachers did. I, I think the only reason why we couldn't talk about how like we learned so much about how like amazing Ms. Giris and Ms. Mula are is that we kind of already knew that. But they were a huge part of our Beamline team. So I think a big shout out to them as well. Nice. Um, Derek Peak, did you want to uh, make any comments as a mentor in the room? And he left. <laughs> oh no, they turned his video on. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a, I, I was really impressed with um, with the students and the level of uh, sophistication. They they took on a lot, you know, like to to go and do uh, sediment sampling and soil sampling and water sampling and and plant sampling at three different sites. Um, uh, you know, some of my master's students would probably give me a, a, a squint eye if uh, if I sent them out to do that. And and I think they would have done more if they would have had more time. Um, I, uh, I, I was really impressed with the sort of level of analysis that they did. I mean, they, they took on their project with sometimes with me, me saying, you know, be, be careful. Um, I'm also glad that there's not uh, problematic levels of selenium in the ecosystem. I, uh, I think Alps, Alps is the <laughs> only one. <laughs> I, I can always find things with lots of selenium. I know some places we can give you some samples if you really want to see big. <laughs> um, but but, uh, but no, I, you know, I think um, there, there's a tendency for old people like myself and professors to get like jaded and think like, oh, these kids, you know, they're no, never going to do anything. Um, but um, I, I left as a, a mentor really uh, excited about what the future might hold for, for young users in the next 10 years over at the light source, if this is uh, a typical of the kind of research that they're going to do. So, I, you know, I think uh, I, I think it was really impressive. And all of that work would have been impossible without you as well, Dr. Peek. Thank you for your support. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. I think that is the end of the presentation and questions. Um, so I will stop the recording and thank you everybody who came to the presentation. Um, however, don't leave yet for Gusha and students, um, but everyone else, if you have other places to go, you're more than welcome to uh, 